Thank you, David. Um, so uh, let's move on to our next guest from the US, uh, which is uh, Mady Hornig. Uh, she's a physician scientist at Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health, where she's an associate professor of epidemiology. Um, she's widely recognized for her work into autism, where she has also cooperated closely with uh, scientists at the Norwegian Institute of Public Health. And she has done a lot of work on the role of the immune system, the microbiome, and environmental factors in the development of brain conditions. So, for the last few years, she has dived into MECFS research as well, and the immune system, metabolism, and microbiome. So, Mady, it's a great pleasure. I welcome you. The screen is yours for about 30 minutes. So, <laughs> there you go. Good morning, thank you for the kind introduction and for the invitation to be here today. Um, it's uh, always uh, invigorating to, uh, to follow on to, uh, to some of the messages uh, that Dr. Tuller has, uh, has presented today because we um, must recognize that there is still such a need for uh, continued really um, you know, uh, active, uh, active uh, resistance uh, against, uh, you know, faulty science uh, or science that may not have the best rigor uh, and standards because uh, it's certainly needed in, in MECFS. So today I'm going to focus on some of our work that has tried to identify biomarkers for identification of uh, MECFS and, and, and hopefully at some point in the future to be able to differentiate it from other like disorders or similar disorders and uh, and to try to also use it for staging um, of interventions that may be uh, uh, where we may be able to predict response based upon biomarkers when somebody first uh, appears in the uh, in the clinic. So, and I will focus today on our work largely uh, on immune dysregulation um, and primarily on the markers that we've been looking at and uh, and continue to try to identify in spinal fluid. So, and there we go. Okay. So, just as a, oh, I'm sorry for. For some of the uh, the glitch there, things are uh, overlapping. Um, we know that there are many disorders that have a constellation of features that include those that we might term to be neuropsychiatric. Um, so they can inc include ab uh, abnormalities that affect the stress response system, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, and other uh, uh, outputs from uh, the stress centers in the brain to organs throughout our throughout our body, and the range is really wide. MECFS is certainly not the uh, not the only one, and uh, ranging from autism um, or disorders like um, anorexia nervosa, narcolepsy, major depressive disorder, bipolar disorder, and even genetic disorders like Rett syndrome and Down syndrome have uh, been associated with immune uh, disturbances. It's always been a question as to whether these are related to, in a causal way, to whatever the triggers may be for these disorders, because we know that the activation of your stress response brain, brain and body circuitry can have a profound effect on your immune system functioning. So some of this could be elaborated and made uh, and certainly made worse through the activation of uh, core uh, structures in, in the brain. So we know, though, that there are a host of microbial or uh, infectious or microbiome factors that are also associated with these disorders. And in a wide range of these, uh, of the 
viruses and, um, and other microbes that are listed here, many have sought to try to create animal models to try to understand when and where in the body one may find these particular agents because they're often very cryptic and hard to find. And I just know that I've you know, just added again to this, to this list SARS-CoV-2, so the uh, virus that causes COVID-19, because it is clearly an important question to consider not only the neuropsychiatric features that can occur in a, with acute disease, of COVID-19, and that is shown now in uh, a fairly substantial portion of, of patients to lead to psychosis and, and other types of very uh, dramatic acute psychiatric responses. But we also know that after the acute phase has uh, disappeared, that there are features that are very reminiscent of ME-CFS, and the ME um, uh, may have a wider range of viruses that have been associated with it in the past, but we do know that it is really critical to take a look at what, whether ME may be a long-term manifestation amongst the many individuals, as many as 40% or more, who have very long-term uh, features. Uh, after uh, after COVID uh, COVID nineteen, including um, some of the key features of uh, of ME like uh, post exertional malaise, as well as uh, quote unquote brain brain fog. We also are really thinking now that the immune system may really serve as a uh, as another sense, just like taste, you know, uh, taste and smell and touch, um, hearing and, and, and sight uh, may be senses that allow us to respond appropriately to uh, stre stressors or threats in our, uh, in our environments that may come inside of our body and, and, do, uh, and do damage. The immune system also appears to be a sensor of, the, of, of, of that sort that may be a first line sensor that may be able to tell us early, like an early warning system um, of impending uh, problems that perhaps can return the body afterwards to a, to a normal state. Of course, we need our immune system to be able to fight off these, uh, these agents. For SARS-CoV-2, if our vaccines are working appropriately uh, or our, uh, the earned immune response that we have, uh, that, that's, uh, that some of us uh, may have as a result of uh, having uh, been infected directly, one knows that these, uh, that the uh, immune system should return back to a baseline uh, after um, and to uh, and not to continue to produce um, inflammatory molecules or perhaps fail to respond to new day-to-day uh, -day, uh, stressors. I keep hitting the wrong button here. Okay. So for Emmy, we have really looked to try to understand how best to develop a biomarker for this very heterogeneous disorder that may have multiple triggers uh, involved and to try to understand how those differences in either the history of what somebody had uh, been exposed to and responded to in the at the onset of disease or their the types of clinical features that they have, how these may relate to the types of biomarkers we may anticipate uh, finding, so that we can look in the right people, in the right uh, uh, in the right compartments, and at the right time. And just as I noted a moment ago, with you know SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19, in the event that there are zero cases of ME that follow on from COVID-19. We still have a really important opportunity 
and it's hard to use the word opportunity, but it is really an advantage to be able to look closely and to really uh, take large numbers of individuals and to study them as they uh, have these longer term features and to understand who gets better and who does not. And then also how do they look different or the same uh, as other individuals who had in uh, the before times, um, in the pre-pandemic era, uh, had uh, features consistent with ME, with ME. And some of the things that we've looked at are the duration of illness. We're particularly interested in trying to define the earliest phases of the disorder, even before perhaps the six month required uh, duration uh, has, has passed. We look at atypical features uh, to try to understand both uh, whether there may be other disorders that mimic ME, um, and that could be uh, the long-term consequences or long COVID uh, group, or it could be that there are just certain distinct subsets. And some of those subsets may have different uh, uh, issues long term that we need to uh, that we need to look at. So one of our first studies was really looking uh, um, at uh, in the peripheral compartment um, in the plasma, of individuals with ME who either had what we call short duration of disease, which was less than or equal to three years, or long duration of, uh, of illness. And we took care in making the best matches that we could um, for sex, age, race and ethnicity, residence, season of uh, uh, sampling, and even time of day uh, in order to try to allow for um, the variables that we could control that can alter immune response to be a little bit better uh, controlled. And in, this, uh, and in this study, we found that if you looked at individuals who were closer to the time of onset of disease versus those who had a longer duration. They had here in blue um, versus the gray bar, which are the controls, and the red are the long duration ME subjects. We had elevations in a wide range of, of pro-inflammatory cytokines, IL-1 beta, IL-6, which depending on where it is and how it's responding uh, is uh, often pro-inflammatory, not always. IL-12 P40, another important factor in uh, immune response. IL-17 A, which is related to gastrointestinal, so GI uh, uh, inflammation or, uh, or dis disturbances. And interferon gamma, which is a, an inflammatory molecule that's highly associated with viral infections. And we, concern, we were concerned that perhaps we were having um, the direction of effect always being increased, that maybe there was just more protein. Um, these cytokines are proteins, and I thought we, maybe we, they were just more protein in the blood of these individuals. But there were distinct patterns, and not everything was increased in individuals with shorter duration of illness. So uh, a factor that's involved in uh, allergic responses, eataxin, which draws cells called eosinophils to, uh, to the site of, um, of some uh, infection or alarm or allergic uh, invader, or also known as CCL11. It's a chemokine. And we also had increases, though, in IL-4, which is a so-called counter-regulatory or TH2 type cytokine-associated allergic responses, IL-13 also increased. And in addition, um, IL-1 receptor antagonist, which uh, is a very key molecule that may have sex differences and may be a more robust uh, response in, uh, in women with respect to IL-1 receptor antagonist being activated when um, 
immune factors like IL-1 beta, which we had found to be increased uh, in, in the short duration group. Um, and so IL-1 receptor antagonists, it would be a natural, uh, natural agent that should try to calm down the signaling in the interleukin-1 system. We found that there were really strong, very strong um, uh, predictive capacity, uh, particularly uh, with interferon gamma, uh, for individuals with short duration illness versus long uh, duration uh, uh, ME. And uh, IL 12P40 also uh, panned out. But some, uh, some molecules uh, had uh, a reduced level being predictive of short uh, duration illness. And we found also that the way in which these cytokines interacted with one another in, in early ME was different than in long duration illness and in, uh, and in uh, the healthy controls. And there, were, uh, there was only one molecule that was involved as a, uh, as a uh, down regulator, if you will, CD40 ligand. Um, uh, as compared to the much more active uh, network of interactions, both positive uh, uh, interactions as well as inverse interactions where one molecule would be uh, working to shut down other, uh, other molecules. So CD40 ligand in the ME, the short ME is working to, um, to decrease uh, other other molecules, but that's the only one that's doing so. Whereas in long duration illness, there's much more suppression, uh, many more molecules involved in that suppression. And there's also a very uh, active uh, network of positive and negative controls, if you will, in the healthy control group. We also found um, that there were um, that these that these subjects had um, a you know a, a very um, long you know the, these subjects were you know very uh, long duration of, uh, of of illness when we were uh, moving to look at individuals with um, spine with their uh, in their spinal fluid as opposed to the peripheral compartments. So in this study, we identified comparator groups, including multiple sclerosis and not, no disease controls. It's hard to get people to, uh, to donate uh, spinal fluid, and it's hard to justify that. Um, and we, uh, we were able to, um, uh, to gather individuals who had been collected at the time of their illness, largely through the work with uh, Dr. Dan Peterson uh, in, in the U.S. and in, in uh, Incline Village, uh, Nevada, and um, we did. We did, should note, however, that one of the um, one of the issues was that there, you know, the year that the sample had been acquired and how long the storage had had uh, been uh, been occurred uh, had occurred, uh, you know, was was a concern, and so we took care to make as many controls as we could for that, but certainly. Gathering samples now is really a, a very big priority. And sorry for the size of this. I did try to resize resize these, but it didn't work so well. Um, in our initial work in this population, we found that there was a very uh, dramatic decrease in in blue here are the ME subjects, red are the comparator multiple sclerosis subjects, and then the healthy controls. So healthy controls have many more, have, have, has have much higher levels of a wide range of uh, immune molecules in their spinal fluid compared to uh, ME subjects. And so there's a very profound uh, decrease. And it should be noted that while we think of inflammation or cytokines being a an adverse type of phenomenon. We also need cytokines in our brain in order to do the work of remembering and 
uh, allowing us to think appropriately. So um, one does wonder whether some of the brain fog that is associated uh, with, with ME could be related to some of the decreases in some of these key molecules. In particular, IL-6 has been shown in animal models uh, where they're uh, genetically manipulated to not make IL-6. Those animals have a very dramatic memory deficit in addition to other uh, uh, types of issues. And there were, uh, there were some molecules that were not uh, really altered in this uh, in this analysis, and we so we didn't think that there was only um, the the uh, time and duration of uh, of the sample being kept uh, as as part of the issue. But we um, then looked at the um, uh, oops, sorry, and then IL one receptor antagonist was also very low. If you recall, in the blood. Um, and similarly, in the spinal fluid, IL-1 receptor antagonist is, is really important to counter any in, uh, inflammation, particularly in the IL-1 signaling system. And here we found, um, again, very uh, sparse uh, networks in uh, the uh, subjects with ME. There were also fairly sparse networks and cytokine-cytokine and interactions in the MS group. Um, and uh, in the no disease control, there were much more tight uh, interactions, and there were no factors that were driving uh, a, a suppression of immune molecules in uh, in in the uh, in the brain. Um, likely in part because they didn't have any inflammation going on, so there wasn't it didn't there probably wasn't a necessity to. Uh, to reduce these, uh, 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 some type of danger molecule. And we found, though, that there were um, a number of factors that were uh, also, uh, that held up in uh, what's called machine learning, uh, high, uh, uh, high dimensional data reduction uh, studies that selected IL-1 uh, beta um, and really dramatic in decreases being associated with uh, ME versus the healthy controls, and um, we also, and then in uh, compared to MS, there were also uh, increases, um, but not significant in factors like IL seventeen A, which uh, we'll return to in a moment. So, in the interest of phenotyping, again, we found, and well, Dr. Dan Peterson actually found, um, you know, 20, 15 to 20 years in many cases before the spinal fluid studies were ever done. Um, uh, this, you know, really excellent clinician uh, had put the groups, split the groups into atypical and classical presentations. And the uh, classical presentations were standard ME uh, with uh, post-exertional malaise and uh, brain fog and a variety of um, other uh, other uh, features. But the atypical group um, either had unusual triggers or cancers um, or uh, were found to have other strange um, inflammatory disorders in, uh, in, in the end. And uh, at the time that their spinal tap had happened, about half and half um, had been uh, both short, dura you know, short duration and long duration in, uh, in both the atypical and classical groups. And what we found was that uh, it, whether you split by typical, atypical, short duration, long duration, there were very distinct patterns that were mostly related to the clinical course of, uh, of the individuals, but also um, influenced in part by the duration, uh, the duration of illness. And these patterns were um, also, um, uh, fa you know, found in some instances to be increased in those individuals who had the classical uh, illness, as we had found in the prior in the prior study, but we found that in particular IL-17A, which is typically a uh, factor that is driven by cells called Th17 cells, 
um, and also uh, in, you know, that would be um, uh, normally increased if there was gut inflammation and if there was a leaky gut and a, uh, an access through the blood brain barrier. So here we, we were really interested in, again, and we, we again looked at the, uh, at the networks and found that there was a very prominent effect um, in the classical ME group with IL-1 receptor antagonist as had been uh, previously identified. Um, and we also, um, and so it was a negative regulator. Um, but only in the classical group, whereas the atypical subjects who had gone on to have cancer or who were identified later with atypical multiple sclerosis and so forth um, had uh, a, uh, a very different uh, pattern and not really uh, much uh, interaction across the, the molecules. And just wanted to, uh, you know, so, so the IL-17 uh, findings you know, suggest that there may be some different features in the classical group than are seen in the atypical group. In particular, our classical subjects in the studies with Dr. Peterson and others I have identified a very high rate of gastrointestinal disturbances as a comorbidity, whereas in the atypical group, those gastrointestinal disturbances were not as high uh, as at, at higher prevalence. And so these important factors in terms of how the gastrointestinal tract signals to the brain and then the brain signals back um, are becoming increasingly important in our understanding. These factors um, have a control over many elements that probably uh, contribute to many diseases but are really looked at in ME uh, as well as uh, as a as a potentially uh, key factor, and the products of the uh, the gut microbes, short chain fatty acids, for instance, can actually alter um, the integrity of the blood brain barrier. These factors actually uh, can leave the gut if there's a leaky gut. Um, and, and gut inflammation, and then they go on to actually work to reduce the tightness of the blood-brain barrier and allow things in from the blood that normally would be kept, uh, kept away uh, in, in order to keep the brain from danger. And other molecules that are actually pieces of the gut bacteria are also um, involved in this process and can directly activate a, uh, a number of pro-inflammatory immune molecules, some of which we saw in the plasma, um, in our plasma studies in, in, in ME. Um, and these molecules can also work to break down the tightness and the, uh, the tight junction molecules at the blood-brain barrier um, and allow for a different type of signaling that may interrupt the normal types of uh, regulation and the normal networks uh, in, in the brain of, uh, of protein protein interactions. We don't yet know the importance of the, uh, gut, uh, the gut disturbances uh, to the disorder. This is uh, in ME in general. We do know that this is a very hot area for analysis in long COVID and the questions as to who may have uh, a uh, prolonged disease and who will not recover and who will be resilient. And so we ask about these, uh, we need to sample many compartments or use markers that can tell us the who, what, when, where, why, and how. That's how you're supposed to write a, you know, a journal, uh, an article in your journalism classes. Um, you know, we need to answer these questions in order to, uh, to understand uh, this, uh, this disorder. And I'm going to uh, end uh, on another uh, uh, call for precision medicine and why do we need to phenotype? Why is it important? You know, the individuals with 
long COVID, for example, many of them have features consistent with POTS. Uh, it may not be postural, they may have autonomic disturbances, and how you get to that uh, type of uh, phenomenon may uh, be in what the trigger is, may alter the, the, uh, the phenotype, but there also may be genetic factors that we can begin to look at, look for, try to develop um, risk scores, genetic risk scores, what we call polygenic risk scores that would be associated with these different subsets of ME um, or for individuals who had had a common trigger such as Epstein-Barr virus, the cause of uh, glandular fever or infectious mononucleosis, which is a common precursor, or you know, in, uh, in terms of numbers, at least in the US, um, SARS-CoV-2. So I think that this is the, these are really the elements that we, that we need. We're really encouraged that uh, there are, uh, there was 1.15 billion billion US that has been uh, dedicated for research on long COVID, but also that includes uh, research on ME. And so we're hopeful that uh, with the uh, with the encouraged uh, with this encouragement of uh, of research that we'll be able to have a uh, an increased uh, return uh, on the investment with many more investigators coming in to uh, to look at these disorders. So thank you very much, and um, I I don't know whether we're taking questions now or or later, but. Um, if they're in English or translated, I'm happy. <laughs> Thank you, Mehdi. That was very interesting. Um, I think we have uh, time for a couple of questions. So I just uh, typed in the chat box that they can ask questions there. If, um, if anyone has any questions, I, I can start off with a question because um, I'm curious what you're working on right now. Are there any upcoming news from your group? Yeah. Yes, so um, we're working on a number of uh, a, a number of um, uh, sort of multi-omic uh, uh, strategies to so using proteomics and metabolomics and uh, looking at the immune uh, responses uh, in individuals before uh, and after exercise test but also um, trying to, uh, we're adding, we've added in a, um, an additional twist in that we're trying to understand the um, residual um, response uh, of the immune cells in the blood um, through a technique of drawing the blood into sort of a petri dish. <laughs> so the blood goes into a, a type of petri dish. It has um, uh, in, the, in the tube, uh, one it exposes the blood and all of the cells that are in the blood to, um, a, to either um, a, uh, something that mimics viruses so with toll three, a toll-like receptor three, so that's a sort of a mimic of a, of a virus so that the cells can respond as if they were seeing a virus. We also have mimic of a bacterial challenge, so that toll-like toll -like receptor four um, uh, is, uh, is one that commonly responds to, you know, in a generic sort of way to, to bacterial challenges. And there's uh, one re relating to um, fungal types of responses as well. So mold and, you know, and, and, and fun uh, fungi. So, um, and then there's a, uh, a regular tube that gives you sort of something that would be the unstimulated. Uh, analysis and so there is uh, you can look at the cells you can look at, at changes in the gene expression in the cells so this is before and after exercise uh, you do uh, ex exercise tolerance test and uh, and then also look at the metabolomics and then also do immune profiling on the same samples um, so that we have this multi-dimensional view and I think I think that is really something that's very uh, very promising, but there's also a huge amount of work that we're planning to with um, uh, along with Solve ME, 
um, a, uh, an advocacy group that was actually largely responsible for spearheading that 1.15 billion um, uh, given at uh, NIH to, to uh, for this cause. We are uh, uh, working to recruit um, a, uh, a long COVID cohort that will be followed long-term. And uh, they've already recruited, recruited over 2,000 uh, subjects with ME. And we are going to be looking at uh, biological parameters um, again, expanding throughout the U.S. so that we're not only limiting to the places where the very few, there's less than 10, you know, really top ME experts uh, in, in our country. So we're also trying to address some of the equity issues in bringing access to people who have had such a hard time finding anybody who will you know, listen to uh, their, uh, their disorders and we're bringing in through virtual means uh, ME experts so that all subjects will have an opportunity for a research grade expert diagnosis uh, through a virtual mobile platform. And we're tracking symptoms over time and collecting samples over time um, with um, uh, currently the samples that uh, blood samples where we can do more um, as opposed to a blood spot, a dried blood spot, we, we will still need to do it uh, closer to larger centers to make sure that the samples are processed appropriately. But we're very excited about this proposal and we feel that it will give us a really good opportunity to identify some of the earliest changes that may occur even before the six month mark, um, which we use you know, to diagnose ME. Um, we, we think that we will uh, have uh, the best opportunity that we've ever had um, to, uh, to, to see what the earliest changes might be. And, um, and then also to follow these individuals long term, because we, str I strongly believe that individuals who recover, who've had persistent uh, problems at, that look like ME after COVID-19, but recover, I think that th this group may, uh, just like individuals who have a bout with infectious mononucleosis, you know, or glandular fever, who get better, but then later have uh, another trigger that sets them over the edge. I think that uh, it's really important to look at the uh, persistent risk that may still uh, uh, be retained amongst individuals who uh, had uh, COVID-19, again, if it is a trigger for, for ME, um, and to try to figure out the best uh, ways to, uh, to keep them resilient and to improve uh, uh, immune and met, met, you know, met, uh, metabolic responses uh, in the long term. There's, um, there's, uh, there's a there's short, a short question, question here. here. Uh, now I got oh, a little echo, but I don't know if you got it as well. Okay, I no, can't. So okay. uh, there's a question from one of the, the, the viewers here. Uh, what are the practical implications of the differences found in the plasma profiles between short and long duration? Um, will it have anything to say for finding biomarkers and, and stuff like that? Can you say something short about that? Yeah, yeah. So we hope so. I think that the, the current work um, on trying to define the earliest clinical features and biological features uh, after an infection uh, and as somebody becomes ill and, uh, and over time, it's, I think that as we get better at, at doing that, we will be able to refine these tests and to ensure that we have the best and most predictive uh, tests and that perhaps we would be able to even uh, uh, do some type of predictive uh, marker uh, e even before a, a, a diagnosis, you know, even before the six month mark. So, but that's going to take a lot of research and, uh, you know, to, to do that. But it's very difficult, as many uh, in this field know, to clearly define duration of illness. Um, when is the onset, right? So, you know, was it 
the you know glandular fever that you had 20 years ago or was it you know that you got better from you know uh and then got sick again which we, 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 you know what do you uh date as the onset of illness okay i think we're gonna round off there thank you Mary, for a very thank interesting you. talk thanks and um, then we will have a short break for 